What exactly is a narrative? And then we'll get into what exactly is a fiat narrative in sorts. Sure. Uh, what is a narrative? That's a little abstract even for me. Yeah, but well, I will concede <laughs> that in order for a culture to kind of hang together, we all kind of have to agree on what world we live in. Like a worldview, if you will. Or, is or just, just a, you know, a vague definition of reality. Mm. Uh, and I think when I say narrative in a kind of vague, all-encompassing way, I think that's what I'm referring to. Uh, just a s story with a general social consensus, which if you agree, you'll, you might be perceived as sane. Mm -hmm. Like we can argue whether we uh, you know, live in a fascist state or in any state or whatever, we can argue that till the ends of the earth. Sure. But if I say we live on Venus, that's not a narrative that's going to garner a lot of consensus. Sure. So when I say narrative, I think the main function is, is just to have some sort of starting place socially. Right. And, and, yeah. and that's huge because, I mean, honestly, where you start is half of where you're going, I guess you could say. Um, you know, what the goals are uh, when you initially set out on, on things like that. So Mike, we're going to talk a little bit about fiat narratives. So in your blog post, uh, you wrote a great post of, of some examples of this, but let's set it up. Um, centralized media institutions create, quote, fiat narratives by forcing self-serving interpretations of reality on the public. In the same way that fiat currencies are valuable only because governments say they are, fiat narratives are true only because media corporations say they are. So just a little bit of framing, fiat currencies, the dollar, the euro, etc., they get value by central banks, governments, uh, working in tandem to basically say what their value is. And then fiat narratives um, are only true because media corporations kind of frame them that way. So let's kind of dive into that. Sure. So fiat narratives. Sure, fiat narratives first. I can't take credit for the term because uh, Ben Hunt of Epsilon Theory came up with it first. Okay. I thought I had come up with it, but someone helpfully informed me okay. that uh, there was someone even cleverer than I. Mm. And uh, fiat, the word, is Latin for let there be. Oh. In, okay. in, you know, in a lot of colleges, you know, fiat lux, let there be light. Ah, uh, there, okay. there are a I lot didn't of, even know that. Yes. Okay. What, so hmm. when you're saying let there be money, you're <laughs> fiat money, that's where it comes from. Right. And fiat narratives, let this be true. That's what they're saying. Sure. It's, a, it's truth by declaration uh, rather than by, you know, well, rigor. Rigor, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Or something like that. Uh, so that's, that's what's meant by, by fiat narratives, and I think that's clear now. Cool. And then uh, we'll go through some examples. So media corporations have near limitless power to enforce fiat narratives using tactics like these. Um, so limiting the scope of discussion. So Democrat versus Republican, you know, you kind of put two people or two sides against each other and there's no third or there's no nuance or there's no fourth way, etc. Yeah. Uh, in order to perpetuate or keep alive a narrative that doesn't, you know, make sense under scrutiny, mm -hmm. one way to do that is to allow people to sort of vent outrage at each other in a cyclical manner. Sure. Uh, it doesn't matter what the answer is if you're asking the wrong question. Mm -hmm. So this is a tactic that corporate media use to perpetuate a narrative that they would like to be true by fiat, by declaration, mm -hmm. uh, by preventing the right answer from being an option on the table, sure. or from, from preventing satisfaction by limiting limiting the scope of, of discussion, yes. And then if that's one aspect, let's go to, I guess, one side of the spectrum, which is the great firewalls like in China that literally you can't even go on certain websites and that that's just the way it is. If you go on in the internet, unless you're on a, I think a VPN or something right, like yeah. that, then it, you're just not on it. And so that alone shows the totalitarian-esque, authoritarian-esque yes. aspect of that. Yes, that's a, that's a totalitarian way of perpetuating a fiat narrative. Sure. The Chinese government wants you to believe X, well, we're just gonna not let you read about not X. Right, right. And it's pretty simple and straightforward. So if we move, I guess, from the uh, less abstract to the more specific, then it would be things like uh, distributing airtime. I mean, $4 billion of free airtime went to Donald Trump in 2016. 
maybe that had an influence, maybe it did Yes, well, there's a, a famous quote by uh, Les Moonves, the then CEO of CBS. Okay, oh, yes, actually, said, I remember this. Yes, yes. I'll bet okay. you do as I a do. journalist. Yes, yeah. he said, uh, Donald Trump may not be good for America, but he sure is good for CBS. Oof. And that might not be verbatim, but it's close. It's close. It's yeah. close. And when you're ahead of CBS, the top four, one of the top four networks in, yes. the, in the nation, that's, that's saying something. Yes, so it, it illustrates... Um, the, the broken incentive mechanisms that corporate media has in terms of uh, doing its duty to inform the electorate. Sure. And then also, I mean, sponsoring entertainment and media. I mean, the, right now the NFL playoffs are ha- going on and there's huge patronage uh, in terms of nationalism, like showing jets flying over, et cetera. And then also you go into like the CIA involvement in media or, you know, the Hurt Locker, um, Zero Dark Thirty, you know, et cetera. Yes, yes. And uh, the involvement of government agencies like the CIA, like uh, the Department of Defense, for example, uh, lent, you know, the Navy's planes to Top Gun in order to help them. You know, the the military is often involved in the production of military movies. They have to be, because it wouldn't be happening. (laughs) Yes, it's more (laughs) difficult to to DIY an F-14 on an aircraft carrier. I bet that's true, uh, but uh, that's that's one way that you know the the government allows media to exist that it can sort of steer or approve of or have some kind of uh, message control on, mm-hmm. and also uh, the New York Times has a pre-approval process, the CIA pre-approval this. process yeah. that you know when when uh, sharing something uh, important with the public. They run it by the CIA for national security Mm -hmm. concerns. But the Constitution doesn't say we will not inhibit the freedom of the press for national security. It says we will not inhibit the freedom of the press. Period. Yes. (laughs) Yes. So there have have been constitutional, absolutely fundamental breaches of what media is supposed to be and do for uh, America and for the world. So... uh, Government agencies are, are involved in all these sneaky ways, and uh, I believe it was Bernstein of Woodward and oh, Bernstein, yes, yes. The, the Watergate guys, Watergate. Yep. Uh, wrote a fantastic expose on this, on the CIA's involvement in the media, and that's readily available online. I can yeah. send yeah, you definitely. a link. I mean, yeah. even going past the Pentagon Papers, but like the Panama Papers recently, shows how much celebrity is kind of now a newer thing that's just, you know, they have governments, celebrities, all this money in tax havens, basically, just hanging out. And then that was, uh, these papers come out, and then... And then they blow over. (laughs) Yeah. And and the Afghanistan papers... Oh, recently, yes. Yes, yes, much more recently and Mm -hmm. much quickly into the womp womp zone. Yeah, exactly. Very uh, uh, telling, Yes, you can say. Well, and then also, let's... uh, I have a couple other... this just made me think about like whistleblowers in general. I mean, you think of Chelsea Manning with the um, the cables to like Julian Assange to then basically goes out on WikiLeaks and then we have all of this corruption at the highest of levels up to the drone program up until Obama, you know, literally killing a United States citizen, An- Anwar Al-Waqui, who's like 16 years old. That's insane, but that's Again, the media kind of positioning how that that's okay, or this current things with the Iran. Um, so it's just, the whistleblowers are just very interesting because that just throws a throws a wrench in everything. But you've seen the 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 treatment of Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning to then why would people or Thomas Drake, Thomas Drake for the NSA, you know Snowden, etc. You can name them all, and then they've been vilified by the exact media that yeah. should be the people pushing that. Yeah, and given that it's uh, winter in Russia, he probably is Snowden. <laughs> I'll give you two snaps of that. All right, all right. There, so moving on to uh, the two other examples that maybe more, instead of abstract, but more specific or soft, would be scripting local news on a national scale. Yes, there was a viral video that illustrated this very cleverly not too long ago, and it still makes the airwaves, pun intended, now and then. And yeah, yeah. Uh, it ends with, you know, about 100 local journalists saying, you know, and this is a big threat to democracy. This is extremely dangerous for democracy. They say, you know, all together, synchronized into the camera, <laughs> this is extremely dangerous for democracy. Exactly. And you have all these, and it's, it's orchestrated so that you can see the sort of strings being pulled that uh, create a uniform word-for-word narrative that's being delivered uh, in a 
extremely centralized way. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, extremely dangerous to democracy. Absolutely. And then, and then the lowest, I think, well, not the lowest, but I guess you could say the most soft or specific is just picking what goes on the air. And so there, as me as a journal, former journalist, like, I don't know, to, but to clue people in, basically at every morning, usually, you have a news meeting where everyone comes in, you say what you're working on, either for that day in the future, and then the news director or producers dictate right then and there what stories you're covering, what stories you're not. So whether or not you'd cover, say, um, the local cat, you know, fashion parade, or do you go and then use your time to research, you know, the corruption charges in the police department, et cetera. So um, I think a, a big thing of that is uh, the movie Spotlight. Um, I don't know if you've I seen I haven't it. seen Spotlight. Okay. Fantastic, and exactly kind of what we're talking about. But long story short is basically that it was about the Catholic Church and Archdiocese in Boston, very religious, as, as you know, and that basically that was dictating the narrative on how the Boston Globe was reporting on that. And then it took literally a small uh, you know, group of journalists to then get that out. Uh, they stood to their guns, and then eventually the Pope uh, resigned, you know, Ratzinger, because he had facilitated the moving of, you know, church prefects or people around or something like that that Spotlight had reported on. It won the Oscar for the movie adaptation, but phenomenal how you, you don't, we don't have to cover Justin Bieber, as you said. Uh, we don't, ha we can cover Congress in a, a different way. There's different ways to do that. So just go into talking about like the specificness of this story versus that story because that's as easy as one person's ideal viewpoint and what they're kind of being paid for at, at a network in a yeah. grand scheme. It, it, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then no amount, and as you said, no amount of public art cry or reasoned dissent can change fiat narratives if doing so would threaten the power of their issuers. So how much power does, you know, New, the New York Times, the paper of records still have? How much t power does say, uh, a local news station have in, the, in those kind of senses? Uh, it's hard to quantify and that's the problem. Absolutely. That's, that's, a, that's one, of the, one of the problems that Idea Market aims to fix. Sure, and then we'll get into that in a little bit, um, but those problems, let's talk about the tobacco strategy. We talked off air uh, before that, but it basically was, the tobacco strategy was in the 1980s, uh, or no, sorry, even f before that, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, where they basically poo-pooed the research uh, linking smoking and lung cancer. And that they just, you know, put out media report after media report or narrative after narrative. And then eventually it took us 40 years to get over that. But the same people that are doing that are now doing that for climate change. And so let's talk about how, you know, propaganda, if you will. Um, a lot of people think about propaganda as something as like Stalin or way back when in those kind of times. But so, propaganda is very subtle even nowadays uh, in terms of um, target advertising, etc. So I guess let's just riff on how propaganda kind of influences these n networks, um, especially into like digital networks such as Facebook, Google, Twitter. Have you heard the name Edward Bernays? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, so of course. Edward Bernays is Sigmund Freud's nephew, which you know, but yeah. I'm saying just in case anybody <laughs> yeah, yeah, hasn't yeah, sure. heard yet. Yeah. And he pioneered, pioneered the field of public relations about 100 years ago. Bernay, oh yes, of course, yes. yes. Now it's, yep. He yep. used Freud's uh, theories about the unconscious to help institutions shape public narratives. And the word propaganda already had kind of an icky connotation. Oh yeah. So yeah. they called it public relations. Mm -hmm. And that's an industry that still exists. Still. And uh, is probably not the only instance of itself. But in any case, we have a very long tradition of controlling the narrative on an institutional scale. Uh, and we're only getting better at it, especially now that we can have targeted advertising and filter bubbles and algorithms that not only are closed source, but a lot of people don't really care about. You're having fun on Facebook, why would you look under the hood? Do you have Dopamine. the technical tools? to yeah. do so. Um, the power of, of propagandists has uh, increased with the power of, of uh, anybody to access information. So who was it? 1985, he wrote Amusing Ourselves to Death. Oh, Neil Postman. Neil Postman. Great. One of the best. That was a prophetic book. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, Aldous Huxley, who said, 
uh, or was it Huxley? Anyway, somebody said, there's no need to really combat the truth to just drown it in a sea of irrelevance. Oof, yes. And that's, that's one of the uh, frequent tactics that, uh, that's employed now. Uh, it's very easy to get a quick dopamine hit. It's very easy to spark outrage and to kind of circumvent the critical faculties. Mm -hmm. And not only is it easy to do that, it's profitable. So one of the main ways uh, propaganda propagates is uh, just by uh, pushing the buttons and, and cashing in when we can't resist. Right. And people, individuals, have no antibodies necessarily. Mm, it takes a great point. deal of, of effort and discipline and, and more than most people have the luxury of developing. If people right. are just trying to survive or you know, want to check Facebook on their smoke break to get a laugh or, or whatever, um, they don't have an arsenal to go up against an arsenal of propaganda powered by modern technology totally. that exists to exploit and deceive them. Uh, so it's not really the public's fault that we're in the state we're in. It's, uh, it's a matter of uh, who has power and what it's being used for and for what reason.